so last week we began a series that we're calling Unapologetic, um, in that it is the responsibility of every Christian to, one, be on a continual pursuit of knowing and understanding truth, right, of what God says is true. And so we want to be able to comprehend that and to apply it to our lives. But number two, we need to be able to defend the truth. Paul says always to be ready to make a defense for the hope that is within us. And so we are going to take a look at some of the areas where the church is in direct conflict with our culture. And we're going to go straight at them. And we're, like I said, we're not going to sugarcoat anything. We're not going to pull any punches. And we're going we're gonna to wrestle with these really difficult issues. So that way we can boldly speak the truth, but also do it in love and gentleness. right? And that if there is truth, then it should be knowable and we should be able to explain that to the other people in our lives. Um, but this morning, we're going to look at something a little bit different before we get into those. And we're going to be, we're going to look at a passage in Deuteronomy. If you have your Bibles, open up to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Um, the verses will not be on the screen this morning, so you'll need to look it up for yourself. Um, and if not, then you'll just have to listen to me read it. Um, now, I'm going to read this passage, and you're prob- at first you're probably going to be thinking, what does this have to do with what we talked about last week and what I said is going to come? And it's going to, it may seem a little confusing at first as to how this relates with when we're going to talk about issues of abortion and gender and, and marriage and things like that over the next few weeks, um, but hopefully by the end of the morning, you will understand why I chose to include this passage in this series. So we're in Deuteronomy. Um, Deuteronomy is the, the second telling of the law. Um, you see, Moses brought the Israelites out of Egypt and took them to the promised land. And before go, getting there, he gave them the, the law of Moses, right? The Old Testament law in uh, the second half of Exodus and Leviticus. But then the people didn't have enough faith to believe that God would actually be able to hand over the promised land to them. So God made them wander around the desert for 40 years. And so by the end of the 40 years, all of the people that had come out of Egypt are now dead, with the exception of Moses, who would not himself actually make it in. And Joshua and Caleb, who were the two spies, were the only ones that were courageous enough to say, yes, if God is with us, then nothing can stop us. And so now Moses is speaking to the next generation, and he's, he's retelling them the laws that God had given them on Mount Sinai. And so, uh, Deuteronomy 4, and we're going to look at verse 19, but in order to understand the context, we're going to back up to verse 15. So starting in Deuteronomy 4, 15. uh, Therefore, watch yourselves carefully, since you saw no form in the day that the Lord spoke to you at Harem in the midst of the fire. Beware lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourself, in the form of any figure, figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish in the water under the earth. Right. So here we have a, a pretty standard warning against idolatry. And it's not just about worshiping false gods, but it's also about making idols for the one true God. Because God is a spirit. He does not have a physical form. And so any attempt to make God like something that we see here on earth is going to be diminishing who God is is. Right? He's like, you, I, you, you don't know what I look like. Don't try. And keep in mind, they, they were just coming out of Egypt, and they had idols for everything, right? And all their idols looked like eagles and birds and crocodiles and different things. And so that's the context that they were coming out of. And so it would be natural for them, oh, well, if we want to worship our God, then we should make an image of him because that's what everyone around us has always done. Um, think of when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and they had made the golden calf. That golden calf wasn't to a false god. That was supposed to represent the one true God, but they were worshiping him in the wrong way, right? And that God cannot be tamed, can, God cannot be contained in anything that he created, 
right? The creator is greater than the creation. And so to try to represent God in the creation will always fall short of who God is. And so we're forbidden from doing that. Now we get into verse 19, and this is what I want to look at this morning. He says, and beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, you be drawn away, er, away and bow down to them and serve them, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the people under the whole heaven. Right, so at first it's, right, don't make any images about animals or people or anything like that. We don't worship statues. But now he's saying we, we don't worship the sun, the moon, the stars, and all the hosts of heaven. And that phrase, host of heaven, is what I want to zero in on this morning. Because what exactly does that mean? And so a common interpretation of this verse is a warning against astrology. Right, and worshiping things in outer space. Right? And we, we know for a fact that virtually every pagan religion, well, so pa- pagan, that'll be under, important to understand for the rest of the morning. Pagan means polytheistic. These are people that worship multiple false gods. And so all throughout history, we've seen sun gods such as Ra from the Egyptians and Mithra and Apollo from the Greeks and Sol in Syria. Right, and all, all of these are, are sun gods. And then we have moon gods like Kansu and Agni and Sin and Artemis and Selene and, and Luna. All of these are, are people's attempts to look up and see these, these, these things in outer space and like, oh, that must be a god and I'm going to worship that. And so that's one interpretation of this verse is that he's forbidding us from doing that, which is certainly true, right? We, we don't worship the sun, we don't worship the moon, we don't worship stars. But I think when we look at the way that this phrase host of heaven is used elsewhere, um, that that's this idea of don't worship the sun is not all that this verse is talking about and that there's a whole nother reality going on here that we're being warned against. Uh, so we can, we can compare this later on in Deuteronomy 17, <coughs> excuse me, Deuteronomy 17, 3. It says, and they have gone and served other gods, lowercase g, the Hebrew word is Elohim, which refers to spiritual beings, Right, created beings that do not have a physical body. Right? They have served other gods and worshipped them, the sun, the moon, or any, uh, and any of the host of heaven. We see that, that same phrasing there. And so what I want to argue for this morning is that this host of heaven is not just uh, to saying don't worship things that are in the sky, but that these are real spiritual beings that are actively trying to pull us away from the one true God to get us to worship them, right? This is, this is about demonic activity. And I know that's, that's kind of a, a crazy statement. This isn't something that we talk about very often. A lot of you probably have not put a lot of thought into this. So if you'll allow me to try to convince you, when we look at the, the totality of Scripture and what it has to say about this, right? In the beginning of Genesis 1-1, God created the heavens and the earth. When it says the heavens and the earth, that's not referring to, right, the ground and the sky, It means that God created the physical realm, but he also created the spiritual realm. What we can see, that's just half of creation, right? That he created other beings that we usually refer to as angels. And just like with humans, those angels have a a hierarchy, different levels of authority and dominion, and they, they rule over things, and they're given different tasks, right? Think just for us, Right? When God made Adam and Eve, he gave Adam dominion over the earth. That God delights in partnering with his creation in order to rule over the rest of creation. That's why he gives us jobs. And so different humans have different levels of authority from leading a household to, leave, to leading a nation. And in the same way, these angelic beings are also delegated authority and that God is using them to help manage his creation. Not that God is incapable of doing it himself, but God delights in working with his creation. 
And so we see different levels of these angelic beings in Scripture. And there's, there's different language that the Bible uses to describe them. There's this really weird story in the book of Job, if you're familiar with it. Um, if not, go read the book of Job. It's one of the most fascinating literary works in all of human history. Um, but Job 1.6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now, what is Satan doing there? I have no idea. That we, don't, we don't have nearly enough time this morning to cover that. Right? But this, this sons of God, what does that mean? Well, we see later in Job 38, 7, it says, When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Right? So God is, is meeting with these angelic beings who he is delegating responsibility to. And Job 38 directly connects them to morning stars. And so often, like almost all the time when we see stars referenced in the Bible, it's not just talking about big balls of burning gas, but it's, it's the, the ancient people's way of referencing angels and different spiritual beings. Um, we see Psalm 82, verse 1. It says, God takes his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods. Again, that lowercase g, Elohim, simply referring to spiritual beings, right? Angels are referred to as Elohim. Uh, he holds judgment, right? So we have hosts of heaven, sons of God, morning stars, divine council. These are all of these, again, angelic beings in heaven with God. And then we, here's, here's a real, if you think that's weird, look at this one. 1 Kings 22, verses 19 through 22. It's, and Micah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven, same phrase, all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab, who was the most wicked king that Israel ever had, that he may go and fall at Ramoth Gilead. And one said one thing and another said one thing. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord saying, I will entice him. And God said, you are to entice him and you shall succeed. Go out and do so. Right, so we have this host of heaven, this divine council, a, a group of angelic beings that God's saying, all right, who wants, to, who wants to deal with Ahab? And this spirit, this angel is like, ooh, can I mess with him? And God's like, yeah, go right ahead. He's delegating responsibility to different spiritual beings. Right, again, how often do you think about angels like that. Normally, we, just, we only think we, like, we have like an angel sitting on top of a Christmas tree. But these are spiritual beings that God is using to help rule over his creation. But we also know that just like human beings, God gave them free will, just, and just like us, some of them use that free will to rebel against God. Just obvious example of this would be Satan. Right? Uh, Ezekiel 18 and Isaiah 24 describe Satan as being a beautiful cherub. That was a specific type of angel that served in the throne room of God, that got to look at God every single day. But he was overtaken with pride and basically tried throwing, having a coup in heaven and thought, right, I could, I could sit on that throne. I could, I could rule better than God. And as a result of that, he was cast out of heaven. And now Satan is described as the God of this age. Again, not creator God, but a spiritual being who is, who is ruling over this earth presently, right? And that his, his goal is to deceive the nations. His whole purpose is to try to steal people away from God. But what we often fail to realize is that Satan is not the only one of these beings, but he's got an entire army behind him. Now, about 300 years before Christ, the, the, the Hebrew people translated the Bible from, or the Old Testament, from Hebrew into Greek, known as the Septuagint. We'll talk more about that tonight at the deep end. But when those translators did that, they made the decision just to call, or out of all of these spiritual beings, they decided to call all the good guys angels and the bad guys demons, now, it's kind of an oversimplification. Again, it's a little bit more complicated, but for the sake of everything, 
right, for, for us to grasp our, grasp our heads around it. That's what we'll go with because that's what we've done for the last 2,300 years, right? So the good guys are angels. The bad guys are demons, kind of like in the old Western movies, how the good guys would wear the white hats and the bad guys would wear the black hats, right? And so the point of this is that there is a spiritual battle going on <coughs> right now that we are most of the time unaware of. Right, and that Satan and his demons are an active rebellion against God, and God is actively fighting back against them. And sometimes that battle spills over onto earth. Because here's the thing, Satan's smart. He knows that he cannot defeat an infinite, all-powerful, all-knowing God. So what does he do? He goes after the thing that matters the most to God the thing that is made in his image, which is us. And so Satan's purpose and the, the purpose of all of these demons as they're rebelling against their creator is to try to deceive as many human beings as possible and get us to worship them instead of the one true God. We see, we see some examples of this, right? In fact, when we look through Scripture, virtually every time we see a, an earthly rebellion of people rebelling against God, there are traces, right, lying underneath that of a spiritual rebellion happening at the same time. Again, the most obvious example of this is the Garden of Eden, right? Well, the, first, the first sin, when Eve chose to eat the fruit that she was forbidden from eating, why did she do that? Because she was deceived by Satan, right? He's so like, you can be like God, right? You don't, you, you don't need to listen to him, right? You can, you can do your own thing. It's the same thing he did, and now he's trying to get us, to do, and ever since then, he's been trying to get us to fall for the same lie over and over again. You can be like God. Another really weird story in the Bible is in Genesis 6. Right before Noah's flood, it talks about how that the, the sons of God— same phrase that we saw being used of these spiritual beings in, in the book of Job, took for themselves daughters of men, and they created this weird abomination, right, giant hybrid race or something. I, I don't understand it. It's weird, but it's in the scripture, so we have to wrestle with it. Um, it, but Jewish tradition tells us that there are about 200 of these sons of God, also referred to as watchers as in Jewish tradition, um, and that each one of these beings were teaching mankind different ways on how to rebel against God, right? And teaching them things like how to make weapons and armor out of metal and how to use different plants as drugs and things like that and astrology and how to, how to track the stars. And now this is... Extra biblical information, this is, this is not stuff that is the inspired word of God, so you can decide how much weight you want to put into that, but that's how the Jewish people interpreted that story. But again, what we see there is a, a spiritual rebellion that spills over onto earth, and then it becomes so wicked that God has to destroy everything and start over with one man and his family. Right? And so all throughout human history, wherever there is a, a, an earthly rebellion, there is a spiritual rebellion lying underneath it that's oftentimes causing it. Right? And that these demons are actively trying to get us to worship them instead of God. When we get to the New Testament, we see very explicit warnings um, in Ephesians chapter 6, right before it talks about the, the, the armor of God and the blessed breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of truth and all of that, he begins in Ephesians 6, 11, and 12. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Right? As Christians, our battle is not against other people. It's not against atheists. It's not against Muslims. It's not against other people. Right? It's against spiritual forces. 
and that these people are being deceived by demonic influences. Paul tells uh, Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.1, he says, And the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. When we, as, as Christians, when we decide to compromise on what the Bible says, it's not because we're enlightened and we th- we're, we're smarter than the biblical authors. It's because we're giving in to the teachings of demons and we're choosing to worship demons over the one true God. Right? But for some reason, we've convinced ourselves that we're, we're so enlightened, right? that we're, we're much better than those superstitious, simple-minded people that lived thousands of years ago. No, we're not. We're exactly the same, right? And Satan is, and his demons are just as active today as they were thousands of years ago when the Israelites were being deceived by all of these false gods. And when you look at the similarities between what we wrestle with today and what they wrestled with, although we may, may not place the name gods on them, it's the same exact thing. One of the most common gods in the Old Test- or false gods in the Old Testament was Baal, which was the god of the Canaanites. Um, Queen Jezebel introduced Baal to the Israelites. That he's the god that um, that Elijah challenged on Mark, Mount Carmel and is like, all right, first 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 side to get their god to rain down fire onto the altar wins, right? And it was four hundred against one, and God won. Right? Baal was the god of fertility and storms. So if you want children, you go make an offering to Baal. Right? And what do storms bring? Rain. What is rain for? It helps crops grow. In an agricultural society, that's the equivalent to money. So if you want a family or if you want a successful career, you go and sacrifice to Baal. In our culture, what are people after, right? I want a good family, and I want a successful career. And what are you willing to sacrifice to get there? We may not put the name Baal on it, but the spirit behind it is the same exact thing, right? In all of this, right, why would they, why would they worship these false gods, right? What was, the, what was the attitude behind it? Well, I have something that I want, and this being claims that they can give it to me, so I sacrifice something to this God, and in turn, they give me what I want. It's the same exact thing today. Um, One of the most vile religions that we see in the Old Testament was the cult of Molech, which was the god of the Amalekites, which was another one of the neighboring uh, nations around Israel. And in Leviticus 18.21, it says, "'You shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech.'" And so profane the name of the Lord, of your God, I am the Lord. Right? And so Moloch was this, it was this giant statue, it was a bronze statue of a bull that was sitting upright with its arms stretched out. And they would light a fire underneath this statue. And so the whole statue would get like red hot. And then they would actually take their children and sacrifice it to Moloch by throwing their babies into the arms of this burning statue. And the, the priests would bang the drums so loud that it would drown out the sound of the crying babies to keep the, the, so that the, the parents would go through with this. Right? Why would they do this? Right? I'll give you my children if you give me what I want. In the 1920s, archaeologists discovered remains of child sacrifice in the city of Carthage with the inscription MLK all over a lot of the artifacts along with these babies that had been sacrificed, right? It's evidence of the cult of Molech, right? Horrendous, pure evil, right? We all agree on that? Today, we sacrifice two million babies a year in America through abortion, right? And you, we, right, we say it's like, oh, it's, it's women's right, it's health care. I don't know any other health care that involves intentionally taking a human life, but we'll, we'll talk about that more later. But really, what's the thought process behind it? I'll sacrifice my unborn child if I get my future and my life back. It's the same thing. 
it's just as wicked as what they did, right? It's, 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 it's demonic. It's the same thing as what the ancients did. Um, several weeks ago when we were going through the book of Galatians, I talked about the cult of Sybil, which was uh, common in that region in Galatia and central Turkey. Um, and Sybil was the female goddess of love, lust, and sensuality. And that the priests would emasculate themselves. They would literally cut off their own genitals with a knife and place them into a box and give them as a sacrifice to their goddess. Right? What do we have today? Our culture is convincing young boys and girls to emasculate themselves and to mutilate their own genitals basically as a form of worship to this ideology of gender fluidity and, and transgenderism. It's the same thing, right? And those are kind of, I know those are kind of extreme examples, but they're happening all around us. Here's one that may hit a little closer to home. Um, in Daniel chapter 3, king, er, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonians, erected a 90-foot gold statue of himself and ordered the entire kingdom to bow down and worship my image, right? Aren't you so glad that we live in a culture today that is not so self-absorbed and obsessed with, with portraying images of ourselves? Right, what is, what is social media, right? Look at, I'm, I'm gonna take a selfie of myself every day and I want everybody to look at how beautiful I am. How many celebrities and athletes and models make a living off of plastering their own faces all over TV, in the internet, in billboards saying, look at me so I can sell you products? Obviously, right, taking a selfie doesn't mean that you're worshiping demons, right? That, that's, that's, a, that's a big jump. But think about what is the mindset behind it. Are you worshiping God or are you worshiping yourself? Again, not a sin to post a picture of yourself. That's not what I'm saying. But right, Satan is actively trying to pull our attention away from God and onto him. And sometimes... He does, we don't have to worship Satan for Satan to win. If we worship ourselves, that's just as good for him. Because all that matters to him is that he's pulling our focus off of God. Right? And so we look at the comparisons between the way that we act today and the way that people acted thousands of years ago. It's the same thing. We're not as enlightened as we like to think. We're not that special compared to human history. We're falling for the same tricks over and over and over again, right? And this is what it all boils down to. When we compromise on truth, right? Again, I'm not talking about issues of preferences or, or styles or, or how, how you think things should look, but there are, there are things that the Bible is very clear on that are right and wrong. And as Christians, when we compromise on those things, Right? When, a, when a pastor performs a same-sex marriage, when we, when we celebrate somebody transitioning into a different gender and mutilating their own genitals, right? when, when we do these things, we are choosing to stop worshiping God and we are giving in to demonic lies. We are losing the battle. Right? Think, of, think of our children. How many, how many times have you heard people say, right, oh, well, I don't want to force my kids into something. I'll let them choose, choose for themselves. Right? And, and ultimately, you cannot choose the outcome of your children. But let's reframe this. Right? I'm going to say the same thing, just in different words. Right? Now, right, okay, kids, you can either choose to do things God's way or you can go worship demons you, you make, you're, you're free to make the choice for yourself. It's the same thing, right? It's the same thing as, as an Israelite saying, do I want to worship God or do I want to worship Baal, right? Do I want to do things God's way or do I want to pursue a, a life full of money and self-gratification, right, and all of this? It's the same thing, right? S Satan and his demons are just as active today as they were back in ancient times. And we're falling for the same tricks over and over again. And we may not put the same labels on them, but it's the same exact demonic activity.
And so when we go forward over the next couple weeks and we look at some of these issues and some of the ways that Christians over the last several years have begun to compromise on what God's word says, we have to realize that this is not just my opinion versus your opinion. This is God versus demons. And that they're, right, the, the consequences of these battles are extremely important. But here's the good news. I read the end of the book. God wins, right? The, the victory is guaranteed. The only question is, which side are we going to choose, right? Do we have the courage to stand up for what God's word says, or are we just going to take the easy path and go with the rest of the culture? Again, I read the end of the book. It doesn't work out very well for them. I don't want to be on that side. I don't want to have eternal damnation because of my sins. I want grace that comes from knowing Jesus and for standing up for that. Right? So that's, that's the reason, again, if you're wondering, why would I take a series about apologetics and go to an obscure verse in Deuteronomy? And that's because the consequences of this are much greater than we realize. That there is so much more at stake here because this is not just about an opinion. This is about truth versus demonic false teachings. All right, so with that being said, I want to invite my 